Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third Nichigo Global JBridge webinar on ag tech opportunities in Australia. My name is Tak Adachi, the Queensland Trade and Investment Commissioner in, uh, for Japan. I'll be your MC this afternoon. Before we begin, I'd like to respectively acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and the elders both past and present. I also like to offer my sincere condolences to the family, friends and uh, colleagues and the people of Japan uh, mourning the tragic passing of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The Nichigo uh, uh, Global A uh, uh, J-Bridge webinar series, an initiative of five Australian state governments, the JETRO and Consul General of Japan in Sydney, supported by the Australian Japan Business Corporation Committee or the AJBCC, Innovation Dojo, and other consul generals of Japan in Australia is designed to highlight the potential of innovative Australian companies to forward-thinking Japanese corporations. Five events will be held during 2022 as part of the webinar series. Webinars on clean energy, as well as space AI robotics will be held following this ag tech event and the webinars on cybersecurity and medtech have already taken place. This AgTech webinar is the third event in this series and will be delivered by Queensland Government uh, Trade and Investment Queensland team and will highlight the breadth of opportunities in AgTech nationwide, stating, uh, starting with an overview of opportunities in Queensland and Australia, then showcasing one high potential company from each participating Australian state. We are also very honored to be joined by Mr. Maso Ono, Consul General of Japan in Brisbane, who will provide the closing remarks at the end of this webinar. With that being said, I'd like to welcome Mr. Owen Williams, General Manager of AgTech Logistics Hub, to provide an overview of opportunities in Queensland and Australia. Owen, please. Thank you, Jack. Can you hear me? Yes. No worries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity to talk about this wonderful topic of ag tech and logistics. My name's Owen Williams. I'm the general manager at Ag Tech and Logistics Hub. Um, based in Brisbane, uh, sorry, in Queensland, in Toowoomba, just outside of Brisbane. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a sec. Firstly, um, we're in an exciting time uh, with Australia's ag tech and in industry at the moment, with the, um, I think the four main drivers all aligning. Um, we have government that's recognised that the Australian's next $100 billion industry um, is going to be, by 2030, is ag tech. We have big business, a, a vital part of the Australian economy, um, putting investment and income into this exciting sector. We've also got peak lobby groups, um, in such an example as the National Farmers Federation, which is the peak farm body group, supporting digital technology in their strategy to meet $100 billion by 2030. It's a big component of their strategic document. And we also have farmers recognising that to boost their agricultural production by another 25% to reach the $100 billion, the ag tech will play a vital part of this. So with all of these four drivers aligning, we are starting to see the focus and the business starting to raise around this ag tech sector. Queensland itself um, has a lot of strengths and capabilities within this sector. 88% um, of Queensland's land is used for agri-food production. With this being said, agriculture is a focus for the actual industry and also for our government levies, our government funding and our government policies. It has developed a thriving Queensland ecosystem centred around e innovation, supporting agri-food production. 
the ag tech has been a big part of it. And even as late as yesterday, I was in an ag tech seminar where we had almost 300 people sitting around a room talking about today's innovation around supply chain in agri-food. The most diverse agroclimate in Australia is Queensland. And we have an economical validation and scalability because of this. And what I want to point out is that in this climate, we have tropical, we have temperate, we have dry land feeding, and that sees over 95% of the actual Australian segments of agriculture being represented in Australia, in Queensland. Significant private and corporate investment into the digital infrastructure and ag tech programs is ongoing in Queensland. And I think it's important to point out that we have private and corporate uh, investment happening. We have companies like FKG, we have farmers putting into pulse uh, data centres, we have the hubs themselves being developed by private and corporate investment. So it com culminates with the actual government funding, which I'll talk about later on. Recent developments in the Queensland Ag Tech and where I'm speaking from today is a $6.6 .6 million investment in the Queensland Ag Tech and Logistics Hub. The hub itself is a physical presence itself with a building full of state-of-the-art um, facilities and a new build to be carried out by the end of the year 2023 of a $20 million innovation centre. The centre has been set up to bridge the gap between industry challenges, being the farmers and producers, and agribusiness and the problem solvers being the innovators. And we do this by fast tracking the deployment of innovative solutions. The hub itself is located in the Atlas precinct in Toowoomba out at Wellcamp. This precinct is set up around innovation and efficiency for scaling businesses. We have over a billion dollars worth of factories being built here at the moment and all with an agricultural scheme on. We've got majority of the seed companies here We've got machinery companies coming in and we've got a lot of irrigation companies coming in already. Within the 300K radius of this actual hub, we have over 95% of all ag sectors represented in Australia. This for an innovator and also agribusiness makes it very efficient for validating and go to market testing. We've seen a lot of efficient scaling through this ability to go over all ag sectors in a reasonable amount of time and efficiency. We've developed and invested in an ecosystem that includes industry, innovators and investment. The ecosystem has become a huge potential and an asset for everyone tapping into the actual ag tech and logistics hub. We have a thriving ecosystem that is built around activities like meetups, um, pitch nights, open innovation programs, accelerators, and a growth and challenge program. As I said earlier, we have a $20 million building being built to provide state-of-the-art facilities for innovation. And this is coupled with a $50 million build of a Pulse data center. The data has become a vital part of the ag tech innovation side of it. And we wanted to make sure that we had the infrastructure there for the innovators and the growers is a unique program solving challenges, business development and accelerating deployment. We also remain agnostic and take no equity in the innovation so we can provide the best for Australian and overseas farmers. We build clusters at the Ag Tech and Hubs and we drive solutions and opportunities by joining companies together around a common challenge. The latest ones have been around digital connectivity, which is a major challenge in our industry, but we've been able to do that with a cornering partnership with Telstra and lots of other companies that have bespoke opportunities to actually solve the challenge. We are building a cluster at the moment around water and the reuse of water, and we have other clusters being developed around challenging items that we face in agriculture, including labour, digital platforms, carbon, drones, cybersecurity and waste. A couple of case studies, industry led, we have an opportunity for improvement program where we take the innovators that you'll see in the left hand side of your program. We do validation, which you can see below of the tech. And we work through a program with Stockyard, who is one of the biggest feedlots in this local area doing over 500,000 head. 
we were able to identify 20 areas of uh, improvement and we are now in the process of deploying 13 parts of innovation. Another case study is where we've brought agribusiness, being PB Agrifood, and a company that is specialised in AI, Go Micro. With this scenario, we are using the AI to evaluate the grain, work through the actual accuracy of the sorghum, the mung beans and the grain, and making sure that we actually have a process that actually delivers over 95% efficiency. We've now also developed the chain of business development with 14 more feedlots wanting to come onto this program. So Go Micro have actual industry validation where they've coordinated, they've collaborated with the actual agribusiness, and now we've got a commercialization program. Endrip is an Israel business that we've landed here at the hub. They are a resident of the hub, enjoying free residency. Landed at the hub one year ago with one employee. They participated in a program of ours called Commercialise and Grow. The business has grown substantially and continue to grow into Queensland, New South Wales, India, where we had a delegation presented by the TIQ, um, Trade Investment Queensland, and now exploring routes into New Zealand. Their team has grown to nine staff and going to 13 by the end of the year, and their revenue will more than quadruple in a year. The investment in Queensland sector is strong and with regular intensity. Our job at the Ag Tech and Logistics Hub is to use our website and our socials to promote and support the Ag Tech Hub's um, funding that are coming out from the government. We also, though, recognise there are plenty of other ways to get funding for innovation, including the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, the universities that we have partnerships with, councils, federal, corporate in particular, and we use our ecosystem to unlock and help build the innovators ability to find investment. Our final thing is with partnerships with Japan, we want to align to the success of what that looks like for you. We don't build any assumptions around this. We want to understand and clearly articulate your plan for success. We then will bring in the coordination and collaboration with local innovators, local industry, local government, local researchers if required, and then build the plan to help commercialise through the go local go-to-market programs that we have developed, but also build up opportunities for dual investment opportunities, with the opportunities to invest into Japanese tech and Japanese to invest into Australian agricultural tech. We want to deliver validated and scalable ag tech with a proven go-to-market program. Finally, my key takeaways from this meeting, and again, thank you for the opportunity, is Australian ag tech is exploding in a perfect environment. Queensland has unique strengths to accelerate validation, go-to-market testing and commercialisation. Queensland government and private investment in ag tech is strong and willing to invest in good innovation. Ag Tech and Logistics Hub accelerate the coordinated, collaborate and commercialise program. And Queensland has a proven track record of ag tech development. Thank you again. And please reach out if you have any queries. Much appreciated. Thank you. Great. Thank you, um, Owen, and for your in valuable insights. And it's great to hear about all these opportunities that exist in Queensland and in Australia nationwide. And I think you already got a few questions online as well. So uh, now let's look at, uh, let's uh, move on to the startup pitches from the uh, from uh, representations, uh, representatives of each participating Australian state in the order of Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to talk about their company. So first up, I'd like to welcome Mr. Louis Frost, uh, CEO, of, CEO of Seristag from Queensland. Thank you, Louis. Thank you very much, Tuck, and thank you very much for having me at this event today. I am from Seristag, and we have established our business in Brisbane, in the capital city of Queensland where we are creating the world's most comprehensive animal monitoring company. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey. First of all, we started in agriculture. Why agriculture? Well, we believe that in agriculture, 
we're going to need to feed a growing global population in the face of less available arable land and fresh water resources and other inputs like fertilizer in the future. So why technology and agri-technology? We believe technology will be required to drive the efficiencies and production on those farms to meet that growth in demand. And that's what's really driving agri-technology right now. And we need to see this technology coming not only on the farm, but also right throughout the supply chain. We need the traceability of the products. We need the food safety and food security of the products. We need to protect the biosecurity of the farm. And we have a modern consumer today that when they get their food, they've never cared more, but at the same time known less about where that food comes from. And we believe we can use technology to help the farmer and the consumer solve those problems. So what we've done is right here in Queensland, we created the world's very first direct to satellite smart ear tag for livestock. And we use that smart ear tag to track an animal's location, its welfare and its activity. And we put that data into a big data platform in the cloud. So how does it work? First of all, the tag has a GPS chip in it. So we know where the animal is. We can go to the animal. We can muster the animal. We can protect that animal, make sure it's not stolen. It's not wandering through a fence. We can also understand how the animal moves around the environment. Where does it choose to graze and eat the grass? And where does it choose to stay away from? We're also doing some work with banks and insurance companies on how this information changes their business. We're also doing some work with carbon accountancy companies as how this information can change the way farmers access carbon credit units. We're also monitoring the animal's activity so we know what behaviour they're undertaking. We know if they're being hyperactive and very active or if they're laying down and being still and not moving. If they're in distress, maybe the farmer needs to go straight to that animal and do something to that animal to make sure that it's okay. And with some new work, some new scientific work we're doing with the CSIRO, a national scientific body here in Australia, we'll be releasing new technology onto our tag later this year, where we'll be able to tell just through the tag how much grass an animal eats. So this is more intelligence, more data, more insight coming through the tag. Every tag has a battery and a solar panel that allows it to operate for over 10 years. And it has a Bluetooth chipset on it. That means we can talk to the tag and upgrade the functionality of the tag over time and change the way the tag functions depending on where it is in the supply chain. So it's a very, very smart piece of technology. So you can see there's lots of different ways we can create data. What do we do with it from there? All of that raw data is processed on the tag. The tag acts as an edge computing node. It processes all of the raw data and then just the processed information is sent via a network of 36 low earth orbit satellites to our secure cloud platform. From there, we don't force you to use our software. We don't even make software. We let you choose any of the different animal management, farm management, mapping softwares out there. And we push our data out into the software you've chosen to use through APIs. And we can also use the same API to push it out to other places you give us permission to or you instruct us to, like your bank or your veterinarian, or if it was the government who needed to know you were moving animals, whatever the case may be. And in fact, you may be very excited to know we've just finished integrating with a Japanese software company. This is a picture of a screen, this is a screenshot from Rogika a Japanese farming software company that can now take Sarah's tag data and do a map of your farm and tell you where the animals are, what they're doing, if they're okay. And we're very excited. This is our first software partner in Japan. 
and we're excited to get this happening and we're looking forward to getting our first farm set up in Japan. We also have a very easy access uh, way of selling this technology. We don't need to go to your farm or take any measurements. We don't need to set up any antennas or towers. You just go to our website, you create a profile and you buy your tags. We can send them to any farm anywhere in the world. And when you put them on the animal, they're turned on by the applicator. That's all you need to do. Because of the satellite system, you know, no antennas, towers, 3G or 5G is needed at all for the system to work. We've also built tags that we use in Wildlife Conservancy. These tags are on things like American buffalo, giraffes, rhinoceros, wild pigs, wild dogs, reindeer, African buffalo, and they're helping people protect endangered species all around the world. And we've been working for a while now as well on another product for people's pet dogs. It's a small collar with very similar technology that tells you if your pet is healthy or sick. If it runs away, it tells you where it is and helps you retrieve it. And we'll be launching that product in 2023. So you can see we're working right across livestock, wildlife, and companion animals. And we've set up Sarah's Tag to truly be the world's most comprehensive animal monitoring company. I would love to get in touch with anyone who's on the line today who would like to know more. My contact details are here and they'll all be shared with you. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what we're doing and even more importantly, about what you're doing and how we might be able to help. Thank you, Tuck. Thank you, Luis. And uh, it's great uh, uh, to know that our proud Queensland company is already working with the Japanese software company. Um, next up is Mr. Andy Chambers, uh, Managing Director of Airborne Logic uh, from South Australia. Uh, over to you, Andy. And it's uh, lovely to be here and sharing information around AgTech. Uh, globally across our nation as well. And uh, as Owen has described earlier, Australia is certainly and this is certainly the case for Airborne Logic based here in Adelaide in South Australia. And the whole emphasis of Airborne Logic is to enable farmers to respond faster to decisions using remote sensing capabilities, everything from aircraft drones and deep machine learning underneath of this and putting that data into an information format that can be explicitly acted upon by the farmer. And so we're seeing some extreme challenges uh, around Australia and the globe in reduced resource allocations, difficult Time we need to respond to this inordinate challenge of producing more food for the world. So things like plant health and resilience become critical. The impact on our environment and our consumer and stakeholder demands, the expectations that food be grown clean and green, and most importantly, that it's not using additional resources and that, that it's not having an impact globally. And so interwoven with this is the need for farmers to change and to adapt to climate change uh, and work within the natural capital world and value that nat that Airborne Logic has been working on in transferring this knowledge is helping us to address our mission and vision by helping farmers to unpack the importance of making decisions with new detailed data, but put into a format as information on which they can act. So our focus starts very much with increasing precisely down to a few centimetres where assets and plants reside on the farm. And from this precision, we're able to measure down to the plant level and understand some of the aspects that nutrition and water impacts 
and essentially open this up through both a computer platform for the farmer, but on a phone that enables either the farmer or their workers to enter the field and go to precise locations and reduce the overall impacts of not having enough time, the of issues and going straight to the problem at hand. So this precision really is around better mapping of topography, understanding where the stresses and the strains are in a paddock or a crop, particularly water aspects here in Australia and increasingly in other parts of the world in relation to climate change are around the heat impacts on crops, the water stress on crops, and most importantly, the ability to measure this change over time. And we put these tools and this ability in large data sets, but utilising the power of machine learning to convert that data into information formats and put them into a visual method using these mapping techniques. So our process using a combination of in-field measurements plus drone-based measurements, where we're using the high accuracy RTK methodologies and computer and communications networks to bring this into uh, a high definition visual process into a base map, uh, instantly showing the differences in vegetation types, the types of varietals, the types of different crops, and then beginning to label in crops, the uniformity or lack thereof, and most importantly, if there are gaps, how to count those gaps, how to, gu how to count those plants, and how to show that change over time. is show these advanced plant level analytics that help a farmer earn or learn very quickly where the problems are at hand and whether that's a nutritional problem or a lack of water or potentially a pest or disease commencing some form of detrimental impact on the crop. All of this can be mapped and provided through the mapping portal to the in the case of particular vineyard, uh, block counts, row counts, or total meterage of the crop type uh, and the area of the block provided digitally for the first time and moving farmers away from traditionally using paper-based maps into a fully digital format and giving them information at a rate and at a time that enables them to act far more quickly and far more precisely on the problem at hand. Most importantly for most farmers is understanding how that relates through to that lost productivity. So essentially being able to understand uh, and the lack of crop production relate to lost income. And this is a really important process for many farmers to go through. We're providing this portal, this mapping portal in such a way that it's easy to access and therefore easy to action the problems. This goes across various different crop types. And in the example shown here, we have essentially automated the process of counting trees and given the farmer a really clear indication of where the problems are at hand. And so we can quite clearly see in the extreme detail of this imagery, the lack of growth, the missing gaps, and the yellower trees that are not performing as well as the much brighter green trees and those that are producing a crop at the level that they should be. And this is backed up by statistics and the ability for the farmer to analyse in detail how this crop is changing over time uh, and specifically where those problem areas are. It's also a very important tool to be able to make a choice around when perhaps the time has come to completely remove this crop uh, and regrow. 
And so we're seeing many farmers using this tool to essentially make that choice uh, to substantiate budgets and to go back to boards and make financial decisions around when the time is right to, to replace and reinvigorate a particular crop type. The deep hyperspectral analysis that uh, we have essentially taken off the shelf hyperspectral but expensive cameras and developed a workflow where we can really start to see what the problems are inherent in that crop type. And this is an example in an almond orchard where we're the nutritional problems are in this particular in this particular almond orchard and moving towards the ability to also demonstrate differences in overall yield and monitoring that yield performance inside the orchard uh, and again helping with critical decision making about where to from here for this particular farmer this is all about converting observations into action. The image on the left is, and image on the right, this information has been converted directly into tractor software capability so that the farmer can spread different rates of mulch or different rates of fertilizer directly into the farm uh, property. And in this particular case, this has been a process that's been the network on this property directly to the tractor such that the farmer can essentially change those rates of application saving a lot of money on expensive fertilizer of yield outside of the direct farming horticulture and increasingly our work is working specifically in the carbon space where tools to use machine learning techniques to measure canopy precisely and relate that into Australia's voluntary carbon markets, carbon farming methodologies, uh, and get to a very quick workflow using techniques that haven't been utilised up and now until now. And we're now moving this capability into the biodiversity measurement space. And we expect that in the, near, in the very near future, we will be seeing biodiversity certificates and credits globally way increase on the carbon uh, credit level and the ability to is increasing rapidly such that people can essentially determine their ability to carbon farm as well as use traditional methods of farming and mix and match the best potential possible for their possible technique for their farm in a changing climate. We would love to continue that dialogue uh, with any of the companies that might be interested in what we do. All of our contact details are here. It's an incredibly fast moving space and the opportunities are limitless uh, in terms of agriculture globally and Airborne Logic's aiming to be at the forefront of that and particularly into into the rest of the presentations as well. Thank you, Andy. Um, I think for some reason it keeps cutting out uh, every now and then, but um, uh, you um, you have a question already uh, online. That's great. Uh, next, uh, we'd like to have uh, Mr. Tim Hyde, CEO and, and founder of Swan Systems from Western Australia. Over to you, Andy. Uh, over to you, Tim. Sorry. Thank you. Is my share being my sorry apologies? Hi everyone, um, thanks for the invitation today and to be a part of this great initiative. Um, welcome to Swan Systems. Swan Systems is the world's most advanced water management platform where we focus on production, profitability and sustainability.
Modern day farming has experienced a data revolution. The advent of precision agriculture has seen producers flooded with data to help optimize the farming operations. Most people think this is what precision farming looks like, a futuristic iPad with fancy graphs to help you manage your farm with the click of a button. But we've spent 30 years in the sector and we know how the sector works. And in reality, it's very different. All this data comes from different sources. It lives in different areas of the farm and it's not been streamlined to add benefit to the farm. Irrigation management is particularly challenging. Take Tony, for example. Tony has seven apps, two types of soil moisture probes. He has a weather forecasting app, a satellite imagery program, an irrigation control system, a weather observation platform, and some plant-based sensors. A total of seven unique apps and databases to monitor that aren't talking to each other. And then he has to somehow configure out what all that means and how he's going to change his farming practices as a whole. The soil is dry, but it's going to rain tomorrow. So should Tony water more or less? Does he fertilize today or tomorrow? 80% of a plant's performance is directly related to water and nutrient management. So Tony can't afford to get it wrong. To make matters worse, climate volatility, increasing water scarcity are changing the game and upping the stakes in modern day farming. After living this problem for 80 years, the three co-founders have developed Swan Systems. Swan is the first and only software solution that aggregates data from a wide range of hardware and data sources. That means that all seven of the sensors, the probes, the forecast that Tony was tracking are integrated into a Swan Systems platform. We already have over 85 different integrations to optimize operations for the entire farm and that number is growing all the time. This means we have the most cost effective program which can scale faster, easier and at a better price point for most farmers. Once the data is aggregated, then we can start to add value for the business. There's a comprehensive water budget and a crop library, all designed to focus on creating repeatable management playbooks. The system suggested irrigation actually calculates how much water or what the water requirement is going to be for next week. And we can push that back into the irrigation control system, which is a very new concept. The spatial imagery further complements the operating system with access to daily imagery where we can pick up very quickly irrigation issues or pest and disease issues as they come across a crop. The nutrient planning uh, elements, we can use elements in the irrigation water and we, it's very complex and we can use it to, to work out where the nutrients come from, whether they're injected as part of a solution, whether they're put on granular or in the background water. The reporting function, which has multiple user cases, the irrigation manager can see how they're performing. The farm manager can see how things are tracking year to date or week to date or month to date. And the corporate entity can see all of these reports mentioned to report on the water application efficiency and water use efficiency as part of their impact reporting requirements. This means that Tony doesn't have to buy another new and expensive hardware system. Instead, he gets, to, he gets actionable insights like you see at the bottom of the slide on the data sources he already has. So we are truly adding value to his data. And it means he can manage it all from one software program. Our team comes from the irrigation industry. We have over 25 years of experience with each co-founder and we are well-rounded to bring the product to the market. The team's 22 and growing now, and this is our core team here from Australia, but we're scaling very fast.
We've spent many years building relationships with data providers and customers and have rolled the solution out to 250 accounts across seven countries. Notable customers are some of the largest multinational businesses in the world who are scaling across portfolios. Several of these businesses are adopting across different countries and different crop types. Our focus for 2022 has been to establish our US and California office, and we now have four full-time employees servicing that market. We've been well received in the Californian Central Valley, which has 14 million acres of irrigated agriculture. This area is in severe drought, is facing significant wage pressures, and has the customer base demanding sustainable water use. All problems that have existed in Australia, and hence SWAN, which has come out of adversity breeds opportunity, they say, or the, is the mother of all invention. So the issues that we face in Australia, and now we're transferring that, that knowledge to other markets. Since our solution integrates with so many data and hardware sources, the platform is applicable to other things like golf courses, schools, public open space and landscaping. This means the total addressable market is up to $24 billion. It also means that we can work with multiple sectors in multiple countries. We, we currently do golf courses in five countries. I believe we've got one in, in Japan. We work in the city of Melbourne, in the central area of the city of Melbourne, all the parks are controlled with Swan system. So we've got the ability to apply the technology to any irrigated crop. Our users love Swan systems as we add value to their business and help drive production profitability, but do this in a sustainable manner. An average water savings 30% is often achieved. Improved yields and quality of produce of 50% is often attainable. Saving on energy, nutrients and time and more. And a new impact module means the added benefit of making these, making the benefits to water use efficiency, not arbitrary, but we can quantify that now, which is a big step. So in closing, Swan makes complex farming simple. We've proven product market fit and market traction together with our strong revenue pipeline. We're scaling across the globe and believe our product market fit is going to help immensely. We're looking to conduct a Series A 2022 and would be happy to engage with any interested parties should this be of interest. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Tim. And uh, now we have Mr. Ben Lee, the CEO and co-founder of Invertigro from New South Wales. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Adachi san Good afternoon. My name is Ben Lee, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Invertigro. As our global population grows and urbanizes, and our natural resources continue to be depleted at a rapid rate, there is a global need to sustainably grow more with less. Indoor vertical farming has been identified as one of the most efficient means of addressing our global food security and sustainability challenges, and as an industry, is attracting growing attention and investment, with the industry forecast to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 22.6% to be a 24 billion US dollar industry by 2030. Vertical farming is attracting this attention with, this, with the ability to grow more reliable supplies of consistent quality produce, independent of the weather or geography, with significantly less land, less water, and no chemical herbicides or pesticides. By bringing the farming indoors, and closer to where the produce is needed, vertical farming can greatly improve food security of the community, whilst also reducing food miles, waste, and packaging. However, to date, the adoption of these new farming methods has been restrictive due to the cost and complexity to set up, operate, scale, and adapt with changing business demands. So what if the solution looked more like this? quicker to set up and faster to profit with an integrated solution that is affordable, flexible, scalable, and smart, enabling businesses wherever they are positioned in the food supply chain or geographically 
to quickly become highly efficient, sustainable and commercially, commercially viable modern farmers. Originally, we set out to be indoor farmers ourselves, but we realized that the impact and the opportunity as a business was far greater if we could develop a solution that addressed the industry's key challenges. Invertigro is that solution, bringing together unique patented hardware operated by fully integrated and user-friendly software encoded with optimized grow recipes to provide an end-to-end plug-and-play farming solution delivered with a suite of Invertigro supporting services to enable businesses anywhere to efficiently and sustainably grow almost anything. For the planet, this delivers all of the previously identified benefits of indoor farming. For producers, this delivers an affordable, sustainable, and reliable farming solution that is easy to operate, efficient to scale, and which has the flexibility to adapt to changing business needs. For investors, this provides the opportunity to participate in a growing global market with a leading ag tech innovator whose business model is based on OEM sales, in addition to annuity-based revenues protected by a technology moat. Together, Invertigro's unique hardware features and bespoke operating technologies address the key challenges of cost and complexity in the vertical farming industry, whilst also delivering remarkable crop flexibility and efficient scalability. Affordable, flexible, scalable, and smart. Invertigro is vertical farming that really stacks up. And with the flexibility to grow and switch between growing a wide range of crops from food to fodder, pharmaceuticals, and fibers, Invertigro's technology can, able, can enable businesses across geographies and industries. All of these features and benefits of the Invertigro indoor vertical farming system combine to deliver a solution that is quicker and more affordable to set up and scale, simpler, more sustainable and cost effective to operate, delivering higher yields and greater crop flexibility than in market alternatives. Invertigro is indoor vertical farming that delivers benefits for people, the planet, producers and investors. Invertigro has already been well endorsed by impact investors, including Australia's Clean Energy Finance Corporation, a seed and follow-on investor through Artesian Capital, and the Australian federal government through their Accelerating Commercialization grant and follow-on funding. With internationally recognized awards, such as the Future Agro Challenge, Australian Agripreneur of the Year 2021, and finalists of the Global Food Tech 500, and Australia and New Zealand's Climate Tech 100. Invertigro was also selected amongst an internationally competitive cohort of farming technologies to feed the Sensoria Mars simulation at the High Seas facility in Hawaii. And our early customer partners, including Woolworths, which is Australia's largest grocery retailer with the launch of Australia's first in-farm supermarket farming model. Invertigro is currently seeking capital investment from investors who are looking to make an impact with ESG outcomes and good financial returns. Series A funding will be used to facilitate full product commercialization, manufacturing scale up, service model deployment, and early global expansion by capitalizing on current international sales proposals and MOUs. We are also looking for our first customer partners in Japan existing growers or new entrants looking for an affordable, sustainable, scalable, flexible growing solution. And also potentially, uh, sorry, potential countries or channel distribution partners who are keen to work with Invertigro to facilitate and benefit from Invertigro's entry into global markets. Please contact me to discuss these opportunities and the possibilities in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, and I think I'd like to also thank the audience for uh, putting a few questions up on the Q&A uh, platform, but also, you know, have, obviously you can use the chat function. 
for any questions for the uh, any of our speakers. So um, that's great. And then now that the, I'd like to um, introduce our last industry speaker, uh, please welcome Ms. Fern Hall, CEO and co-founder of the Leaf Protein Company from Victoria. Over to you, uh, Fern. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, my name is Fern and I am the CEO and co-founder of the Leaf Protein Co. So 40 years ago, when my dad named me Fern after these plants that he loved to grow on our home balcony, I don't think he imagined that I would one day start a food tech company that makes plant proteins from green leaves, which is what I've done. So I founded the Leaf Protein Co. to unlock Earth's most abundant and biodiverse source of protein, which is green leaves. And how I came to this was because of my food intolerances, where I was looking for alternative sources of proteins um, outside of soy and wheat. And I found that there really actually wasn't much in the market today. And this is a problem, not just for me and a growing number of consumers, but also for the $38 billion plant-based food industry. And so despite this huge market opportunity, food companies around the world really struggle to find lots of different alternative ingredients and particularly plant protein ingredients. Today, there's really only three predominant plant proteins available. And this makes it really hard for the food companies to diversify and create the next generation of plant-based foods that consumers are looking for. And unfortunately, two of these three plant proteins contain allergens that more and more consumers are either allergic to or avoiding. The latest stats show that 30% of Americans and 25% of Australians actively choose to avoid gluten, even though they don't have any intolerance against them. So clearly consumers are becoming much more selective about the ingredients in their food. And that in turn means that the food companies themselves have to be more selective about what ingredients they use where it comes from, how it's grown, and their environmental impact. So our researchers are creating a new category of plant proteins from green leaves. We're using crop byproducts and regenerative and alternative plants. So you can see here, these are some of the examples of the leafy crop byproducts we're using. Um, the first one here is sweet potato leaves, and you can also see leaves from broccoli, as well as cauliflower. We've also been looking at carrot tops and waste lettuce. In addition to this, as mentioned, we've also looked at regenerative plants such as saltbush, which you can see in this first circle, and also seaweed as a potential target biomass. So compared to soy protein, which today is the industry gold standard, leaf protein can offer the same high protein content while being free from those allergens and being more biodiverse. But really it offers something that is much sought after in the food industry, which is a clean label ingredient. And what we mean by this is an ingredient that's free from unwanted chemical residue, which we're able to achieve from our thermomechanical extraction process. Now, in addition to being a clean label ingredient, the other big reason that food companies are interested in trialing our ingredient is because it offers these other additional functional properties. So leaf protein is potentially an egg white replacer. It provides foaming capacity as good as egg white, but with much longer stability. And it also has better gelation compared to egg white and soy and can form stable gels in concentrations as low as 2.5%. It's also a better emulsifier than egg white, slightly less than soy, but my researchers tell me that certain processing conditions do exceed soy. And finally, it's very soluble in alkali pH. So this is our team who are making this happen. Combined, we've had over 70 years experience in research and the food industry. Myself, I come from a product management and product marketing background, where I've worked in that space for over 17 years in both B2B and B2C. 
My co-founder Connor is currently completing his PhD in the US on leaf protein extraction. And we have Rod McDonald as one of our advisors. He's been researching leaf protein extraction for over 27 years and has a number of patents to his name. We also have Jonathan Mittis as another advisor. He's a senior R&D executive who's headed up R&D teams in big food companies and so has deep experience in scaling up lab scale research into commercial scale production. So this is where we sit in the supply chain. We don't grow the leaves ourselves. Instead, we take the waste leaves, we're getting it free at the moment from the growers. Um, we ultimately will buy those waste leaves and we then take that waste material and run our proprietary extraction process to produce our leaf protein ingredients, which is in powdered form. This then is sold to the food companies for them to use in various applications. And you can see some examples on the screen. So it's no surprise that the plant-based market is a big and growing market. In five years time, we're planning to be scaled up so that we're producing at the kilotons in terms of output production. As mentioned, we have a lot of companies both locally and globally who've expressed interest and signed up to test our initial samples. Uh, you can see here just a small handful of the ones that we shortlisted to receive initial samples. Um, and we've in fact shipped some of our first samples to one of them. So these companies predominantly are in the plant-based meat segment, as well as the plant-based dairy category of foods. Uh, and we also have companies um, that are uh, doing baked goods, um, as well as better for you products in terms of what they plan to use leaf protein for. So we've looked at a large range of different leaf biomass sources. And we started off with regenerative and um, sustainable plants that can help regenerate soil health, either with carbon sequestration uh, or with soil desalination. And we started off actually with a leafy, Brazilian leafy cactus, uh, which is naturally high in protein. And we were able to extract a 50% concentrate from that. We then looked at using saltbush which is commonly used in Australia to desalinate our soils. Uh, and we were able to extract an 80% isolate from that, both at lab scale. And then uh, last year, we started looking at leafy crop byproducts. And so we've done a lot of work with sweet potato leaves where we've been able to extract an 80% isolate from that as well. And we've since also been working with the CSIRO which um, as one of the other speakers mentioned is Australia's leading research institution. Uh, and from there, we've actually now started one of our first pilot runs in the US. Um, from that pilot run, we were able to produce a, a few kilograms to showcase at the Big Idea Ventures demo day in New York. Um, and from which we sent off some of those samples. We're also actually planning to do our second pilot runs here in Australia from which we'll be producing those samples for the rest of those food companies. So this is our go-to-market milestone. As mentioned, we'll be scaling up from lab scale into pilot scale, which we started already. And then later this year, um, we're getting ready to do more um, concept development and prototype development with products that make use of leaf protein. And by next calendar year, we'll be looking to scale up into uh, tonnage production. So if you are a food company and are interested in uh, trialing or testing our leaf protein ingredient, or are an investor um, interested in joining our journey, please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Fern. That was a great story. Your father must be very proud of your achievement. And a thank you again for uh, to all the startup companies uh, for pitching us today. It's great to witness the, the breadth of interesting opportunities that Australian agriculture sector has to offer from 
plant-based foods, the smart ear tag, carbon farming, and so on. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Takahara-san uh, from uh, the, he, the managing director of Jetro's uh, Sydney office to talk about their JBridge program and post event survey following this webinar, which enables in, uh, attendees to have business uh, uh, matching opportunities with the company who presented today. Over to you, Takara san. Alasa, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my slides. Just wait. Oof. Yeah, my name is uh, Masaki Takahara, a managing director of Jetro Sydney office. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me just talk about the post event survey, which will pop up uh, when you leave this Zoom platform. When you exit Zoom, a post event survey will pop up. I will, would like, I'd like to have, uh, uh, if you would like to have a business of meetings with any of the five companies, uh, you are seeing the name of the five companies on the screen. Please select that option in the second page of the survey form and we'll arrange the meetings under Jetro's JBridge program. Also, if you have any comments on the webinar, please feel free to write. In case the survey form doesn't appear properly, we will send you the URL for the survey later, along with the URL for downloading today's speaker's presentation slides. So please use that as well. Now let me introduce JBridge program briefly. JBridge is a business platform to facilitate collaboration or alliances between Japanese companies and innovative Australian companies to develop the businesses overseas. Jetro supports cross-border open innovation for accelerating digital transformation. This spans across six sectors, carbon neutral, mobility, retail, healthcare, agri-tech, and smart cities. Specifically, uh, we will provide uh, JBridge member companies of Japan with information on promising overseas companies, support for business meetings with the companies, and support for strategy formulation and business development through experts. If you are interested in this service, please contact with Jetro. Thank you. Thank you, Takara-san. Um, it looks like, so the Australian ag, ag tech company ticks a lot of boxes on the uh, uh, JBRI program. So that's great uh, to know. Thank you. So now uh, to conclude this webinar, I'd like to welcome Mr. Uh, Maso Ono, uh, Consul General of Japan in Brisbane to provide the closing remarks. Ono-san, please. Video. Thank you, Takasan. Uh, before sharing a few thoughts, I wish to acknowledge and express my gratitude to Jetro, the Council General of Japan in Sydney, AJBCC, Innovation Dojo, Trade and Investment Queensland, and other Australian state governments for their efforts and respective roles in organizing and hosting this event. I would also like to thank all attendees, wherever they may be, for being part of this webinar. While the Japan-Australia economic partnership is deep rooted in resources and agriculture, and both continue to underpin our ties, the relationship is expanding and diversifying at an increasing rate. And playing a driving role in this growth is innovation and technology. As evident today, innovation and agriculture go hand in hand and is one area where Japan and Australia can collaborate and produce mutually beneficial outcomes. This is already happening in Queensland with Japanese drone technology being trialed on farms and Japanese government supported research and development at air research facility. Further, 
the change in demographics throughout Asia and Australia's high quality and robust agricultural sector gives rise for Japanese and Australian companies to partner up and take advantage of the opportunities on offer. On the back of a long-term trustworthy and mutually respectful relationship, new connections and ties can be forged. With Japan being Queensland's number one export destination, the time is ripe to create and further strengthen our networks on government, business, and people's people levels. Enhancing our bilateral economic ties are various trade agreements between our two governments, as well as formalized sister city relationships, which provide a structured framework allowing smooth and efficient access to our respective markets. I encourage all of those attending today to dig deep and seek out like-minded partners to share knowledge, to learn, and connect with each other. I wish to thank Mr. Owen Williams from Actec and Logistics Hub for providing a most informative overview on the Australian and Queensland business environment and ag tech landscape, as well as, as well as the startups for their inspiring presentations. Today's engaging webinar is evidence of the enormous opportunities that lay ahead for our two countries to work closely together in the ag tech sector. And I look forward to seeing fruitful outcomes in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ono-san, uh, and for your encouraging words and also um, your support for the um, ongoing support for the Queens and agricultural industry development with, uh, uh, with Japan. Now, I'd like to wrap up the webinar by thanking JETRO, the Consul General of Japan in Sydney, as well as in Brisbane, AJBCC, Innovation Dojo, and all my state government colleagues, alongside all our, all our speakers today, for your insights. I'd like to also express my sincere thanks to, um, to all who attended today's webinar. And I do hope that we are able to show you the ag tech uh, capabilities and opportunities that um, Australia has to offer. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>